This dwelling, the aspect of the universal element or inorganic nature of spirit, now also includes within it a shape of individuality which brings nearer to actuality the spirit that previously was separated from existence and was external or internal to it, and thereby makes the work more in harmony with active self-consciousness. The artificer lays hold, first of all, of the form of being for self in general, of the animal shape, that he is no longer conscious of himself immediately in animal life, he proves by constituting himself the productive power in relation to it and knows himself in it as in his work, whereby the animal shape at the same time becomes superseded and the hieroglyph of another meaning, of a thought. Consequently, the shape too is no longer solely and entirely used by the artificer, but is blended with the shape of thought, with the human form. But the work still lacks the shape and outer reality in which the self exists as self. It still does not in its own self proclaim that it includes within it an inner meaning. It lacks speech, the element in which the meaning filling is, it is itself present. Therefore, the work, even when it is wholly purged of the animal element and wears only the shape of self-consciousness is, is still the soundless shape, which needs the rays of the rising sun in order to have sound, which generated by light is even then merely noise and not speech and reveals only an outer, not the inner self. Because paragraph 695 focuses on the artificer's appropriation of animal life, you might be tempted to say, well, that's very similar to what was happening in the paragraph just earlier with plant life. And now we've got a nice sequence. We go from the understanding and crystals to plant life, to animal life. And we've essentially reproduced the progression that we've gone through before in, in the substantive discussions in natural religion. And yes, that's all true. And you should see that as a sequence, but there's also some important differences between what's going on in this paragraph and what happened in the earlier paragraph 694 discussing the appropriation of plant life. So, you know, what are some of these vital differences? You notice one is terminological. So Hegel here is going to use the word shape rather than just form, gestalt rather than form, right? And that is going to be important. He's also going to talk in terms of Aufhebung, uh, the, you know, the sublation or however you want to talk about it. Here we have a supersession, right? Of the, the animal shape. So we've got a bit more concrete, you know, dynamic stuff happening here. And, and this is reflected in, in what Hegel's actually saying. And it's also reflected in the nature of the material that we're working with, the animal forms, right? The animality, which is closer to humanity, not least because we are among the animals, <clears throat> as classical philosophy reminds us so many times. So let's take up what he, what he has to say here. He says, this dwelling, Wohnung in, in German, right? The aspect of the universal element or inorganic nature of spirit now also includes within it a shape of individuality, which brings nearer to actuality, to Wirklichkeit, the spirit that was previously separated from existence, from, from Dasein. And Dasein and Wirklichkeit, two important terms indicating being, you know, actual, being in the world. So spirit, you could say, was not entirely able to get out of our heads or out of abstractions. Now spirit is going to be present in the world through the incorporation of animality. Now we, we just had that a few paragraphs back though, right? The, you know, tribes and peoples associating themselves with particular animals. What's, what's different here? So he tells us the artificer, 
um, is going to be doing something different here. Right? He talks about making the work more in harmony with active self-consciousness. Who's the active self-consciousness? The artificer. It's, and there's more active self-consciousness involved in being an artificer in this way. Why? Well, because there's two parts to this. One is you are more active by the very material that you're working with because it's an active material rather than a passive material, right? It's no longer just a inert lifeless thing. It's no longer just plants that, you know, okay, they're living, but they're not sentient and they're not going to, you know, move around and try to wiggle away from you. Now you're dealing with active materials and it's also the self part of it that makes it more deep and dynamic here as well for spirit as the artificer. So he says this artificer lays hold, first of all, of the form of being for self in general, the animal shape, the animal gestalt. And if we go back to the previous two paragraphs, right, where we we're talking about an in itself or body and then, a, you know, being in itself and being for itself or the soul. And the goal is to bring these two together. We have a different kind of in itself here. As a matter of fact, there's no mention of the in itself, which means that the in itself has now become being for itself, but being for itself in general, the animal shape. Why is the animal shape being for itself in general? Well, because the animals, uh, you know, although they don't have individuality uh, being for itself in a Hegelian sense, they certainly do have being for itself in a general sense, their entire assemblage of instincts and learned responses to their environment, you know, dealing with being able to seek out food and stay alive, reproduction, um, you know, those that have some sort of social status component engage in those sorts of things. So there is being for itself involved in animals. And we also, you could say, as human beings, give them, and you see this in every single culture that talks about animals, that personifies them, that brings them within to their religious sphere, according them a certain being for self, right? So animal shape, you know, is, is a certain kind of being for self. That is what is being taken as the raw material. Now you might say, well, wait a second, isn't the raw material the things that the artificer is working in, like the wood or the bamboo or the raffia or the, you know, cave paintings, the ochre and other, you know, uh, pigments and stuff like that. Yeah, yes, that, that's very true. And that's, that's another element that's not being discussed here because we can just take it for granted. What is being embodied? What is being depicted? Animality. So Hegel goes on and he says, um, that he is no longer conscious of himself immediately in animal life, as he was back, you know, in, in paragraph 690. Um, you know, how do we know this? Well, he proves it by constituting himself the productive power in relation to it and knows himself in it, that is, in uh, animal life, right? In his work, where, whereby the animal shape at the same time becomes, here we have it, superseded and the hieroglyph of another meaning, of a thought. Why talk about hieroglyph here? That immediately suggests uh, Egyptians, doesn't it? Well, yes, but hieroglyph is also a general term that can refer to Egyptian hieroglyphs, like those that we find in burial chambers, but it can also be any other sort of holy writing, any uh, holy representation, hero, glyph, right? And so, you know, this could be cave paintings. This could be other things as well. And the animal form as what it is in nature is being aufgehoben, uh, you know, sublated, brought into a greater unity by being represented, by being uh, turned into, you know, Vorstellung, being, you know, Vorgestellt, being placed there in front of us by the artificer. The artificer is the one who knows that he is doing this. 
So Hegel goes on and he says, um, what does this mean? Well, it becomes the hieroglyph of another meaning of a thought. The artificer is a thinker. And we're getting closer and closer to more and more thought and reaching a certain, you might say, critical mass or threshold. So he says, the shape is no longer um, solely and entirely used by the artificer. So the animal shape, the form that the animal has, which includes not just its outward shape, you know, as, as if it was, you know, uh, frozen in time by a taxidermist, but what it is that we're trying to see about it. You know, if it's a jaguar, it's power and it's fearsomeness. If it's a lion, another great cat, which by the way, they, all those existed in Europe and throughout the Middle East and they had to be killed off. Um, you know, another kind of fearsomeness uh, and majesty, perhaps, if we're talking about the you know, the bison, if we're talking about the antelope, if we're talking about the bear, whatever it happens to be, all the way down to the lowly frog. Well, all of these things that are within our sphere, they're, they're represented according to their, their essences as the artificer sees them. That's the animal shape, but it's blended, vermished, mixed up together with the shape, gestalt, of thought. What is the shape of thought? The human shape. And Hegel here, uh, you know, there's a little bit of uh, translation stuff that we got to call your attention to. He says, with the human form, Hegel doesn't say the human form. He just says the menschlichen, right? Uh, the menschlichen what? Gestalt, the, the human, you know, shape, the human form, the human Attribute. So the animal shape and the human are brought together in important ways. And this can happen, you know, through uh, Egyptian art where we have animal headed uh, gods, you know, for example. But he goes on and he says this work still lacks the shape and outer reality in which the self exists as self. Right. So it's it, we haven't yet reached the point that we need to get to, which will happen in the next uh, big section. He says, it does not have in its own self, it does not in its own self proclaim that it includes within it an inner meaning. Um, what are we talking about here as an inner meaning? Well, being able to be an agency, being able to explain yourself. He talks about speech, right? the capacity to bring forth interiority into exteriority, as we've seen throughout the phenomenology. And he's got this example here of this uh, statue of Memnon, right? Where he tells us that, here we go, uh, it does not have in its own self um, speech, uh, the element in which the meaning filling it is itself present. The, therefore, the work, even when wholly purged of the animal element, wearing only the shape of self-consciousness, the human shape, right? Is still the soundless shape, which needs the rays of the rising sun in order to have sound, which generated by light is even then merely noise and not speech and reveals only an outer, not the inner self. It's very interesting here, right? He's not just contrasting the human against the animal. I mean, you could say, well, what about the animal? The animal doesn't have speech, except that when we give it to them, like in cartoons or, you know, legendary stories or Grimm's fairy tales or stuff like that. Here he's talking about representation, though, the statue of the human being that has the human form, that has a face that can actually make a sound. There's this famous statue. It was one of the, you know, uh, great wonders of the world where the sun would shine on it and at a certain part of the day it would it would make a sound it could be there were a lot of descriptions of this sound in the ancient world it might have just been a purely sort of mechanical thing happening uh, some people described it as a groan but a groan is not yet speech saying words like I'm saying to you or like Hegel has written in this book <clears throat> 
I mean, Hegel didn't write them in this book. <laughs> Miller translated this book, which is taking speech and making speech, right? A certain kind of uh, uh, craft work there. But you get the idea. We're not yet where we need to be, but we're getting closer. Now we're able to incorporate the animal form, and not in the same way that animal religion did. Now the animal and the human are becoming part of our panoply of you know architecture, statues, you know paintings, other depictions as well, other representations, other Vorstellungen, and so you know we're trying to get to this point where we can actually have a revelation of the inner self. Over against this outer shape of the self stands the other shape, which proclaims its possession of an inner being. Nature, withdrawing into its essence, deposes its living, self-particularizing, self-entangling, manifold existence to the level of an unessential husk, which is the covering for the inner being, and this inner being is, in the first instance, still simple darkness, the unmoved, the black, formless stone, the black stone in the Kaaba at Mecca. Paragraph 696 introduces an alternative to the statue of the human being that has no, no real interiority as the human being as the product of the worker who is a human being, a spiritless outer shape. So he tells us over against this outer shape of the self, which is, you know, a shape of a self, but not a shape of the self. Maybe you could even say, well, could it be the, the self of the artificer? Sure, but it's still just an outer form and it, it lacks selfhood. Um, so over against this outer shape of the self, he says, stands the other shape which proclaims its possession of an inner being. So what we have here now is an alternative type of created object, a, a formed object, a worked upon thing. And it, this is not going to be successful at this point, right? The problem with this outer shape present in, for example, the statue of Memnon that makes a noise but doesn't actually have speech is that it has no interiority as human. It's all pure exteriority. You can break it apart, but you're not going to get anything. There's no soul. There's only body there. Now, the other shape that he talks about, really there's, there's two ways to conceive of this. One is that what he's talking about here is life itself, right? He says, nature withdrawing into, into its essence deposes its living, self-particularizing, self-entangling, manifold existence to the level of an inessential husk. So all of this stuff, you know, think about, you know, the animal world, right? living, self-particularizing, self-entangling, manifold existence. A multiplicity is another way of translating manifold, this, this dynamic interaction. That's just the outer husk, that's the body. And then what would be the interiority, the soul? Well, he tells us the, there's an inner being to this. What would the inner being be? Well, at least in this paragraph, and this is not just where we're going to remain, but this is where we are in this paragraph. He says, it is in the first instance, simple darkness, simple, you know, shadow, simple uh, lack of light, finsterness, right? Einfach finsterness, actually. And then he talks about, and it's, it's not quite clear what he wants us to make of this a black, Schwarz, formless, just formless, uh, stone. Now, Miller suggests that this should be understood as the black stone in the Kaaba at, at Mecca. And the Kaaba is this, you know, sort of uh, construction. The black stone is one item within it. It's, you know, a meteorite, um, and it's, you know, it's been in there. There have been a couple times where it was stolen and well, 
only once actually where it was stolen. But um, is this really what Hegel means? I mean, all we know is that this stone that's being mentioned, and it might be just being mentioned as an example rather than as the exemplification of this. Um, all we know about it is it's black and formless. Formless could just mean it doesn't have any determinate shape. It's not a cube. It's not a, a you know circle or sphere or you know uh, ovaloid like an egg or anything like that. It's just kind of jumbled up together. I mean that could describe a meteor, right? It could also describe a big piece of basalt that's been brought out. Uh, we don't we don't really know, and so I think we don't have to go beyond the text at this point into Miller's bracketing of the black stone in the Kaaba at Mecca. We can just say, look. You know, the inner being here is not something that can actually provide us with the self that we're looking for. Both representations contain inwardness and outer existence, the two moments of spirit, and both representations contain the two moments at once in an antithetical relation, the self both as inner and as outer. The two have to be united. The soul of the statue in human shape does not yet come forth from the inner being, is not yet speech, the outer existence that is in its own self inward. And the inner being of multiform existence is still soundless, is not imminently differentiated, and is still separated from its outer existence to which all differences belong. The artificer therefore unites the two by blending the natural and the self-conscious shape and this ambiguous being which is a riddle to itself, the conscious wrestling with the non-conscious, the simple inner with the multiform outer, the darkness of thought mating with the clarity of utterance. These break out into the language of a profound but scarcely intelligible wisdom. Paragraph 697 now is a very important transition point in part because Hegel is bringing together what we had articulated in the two previous paragraphs as kind of being dead ends and showing that they can be turned into something that's, that's not a dead end, but actually, or not an impasse, but a way forward and a way forward for the, the artificer to turn into, in the next paragraph, an artist. So this is a really important development. He tells us that both of these representations, the representations being talked about in 695 with the statue and this uh, life, this, this you know, living, self-particularizing, self-entangling, manifold existence in 696. By the way, too, I want to mention... Uh, the, the German word here is not Vorstellungen, it's Darstellung, right? So it's still the same um, root, Stellung, putting forward, setting out, uh, instead of for, which we get representation from, Darstellung. So something is like being really like put in our face, right? It's there. So these, these two representations, they both, as he says, contain inwardness and outer existence, these two move, move, moments of spirit, and both of them contain the two moments at the same time in what he calls an antithetical relation, a Beziehungen, right, that is Entgegengesetzte. So they are, they're not antithetical in the sense of being like opposites. They're not antithetical in the sense of being logically, uh, you know, contrasted to each other. They're, li they're literally set against each other. So there's a spatiality to this suggested that we're getting this antithesis in. But it's an interesting spatiality, right? There's the outer that you can see, that you can witness. Then there's the inner that's supposed to come forward, that's supposed to give meaning to the outer, but seems to be lacking in both of these cases, right? So as he says, um, this is the self, both as inner and outer, and the two of them need to be united. Now, how are we going to unite them? It didn't work in the previous paragraphs, uniting these two in the statue in human shape. The statue was missing something, something really important. It seemed to have a kind of communicative power, but that turned out to be false. It had only a facsimile 
of communication. It did not have language or speech, right? Sprache. The other one, the um, you know one that he's described as living, self-particularizing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, he says that one is is uh, the inner being of multiform existence is still soundless as well. It's not imminently differentiated, and it's still separated from its outer existence to which all differences belong. So they're both missing something. They're both lacking a capacity to, you could say, talk back to us, the human creators of them. The gods don't speak. They just are. They take our worship and don't give us anything really in return. And this could lead to a, you know, saying, well, why do we have these gods? Well, here's where religion takes a new turn, according to Hegel. If the forms of religious life cannot themselves open up their interiority to us and speak and engage us that way, somebody's got to give them that capacity. Who's that? I mean, this is kind of funny. Why not God? (laughs) Why can't God do it? It's the artificer. It's spirit, too, as the artificer. But it is the artificer who is doing this. So... He goes on here and he says, the artificer unites the two, the two of these, right? And he calls them the natural and the self-conscious shape. And we should ask, well, which is which? I mean, you could argue both sides for this. Let's take the statue in human shape. Is that a self-conscious shape? I mean, yes and no. It's, it's modeled after something that has self-consciousness, the human being, but we see the statue isn't self-conscious. It says the same stupid, dumb stuff over and over and over again. Brrr, you know, makes a sound when the sun hits it. It doesn't even like choose to make a sound. Maybe it's the natural shape, but it's not a shape of nature, except insofar as the human being is a thing of nature. Yet the human being is the bit of nature that can conceive of nature and understand nature. So, I don't know, maybe that's supposed to be the self-conscious shape, and this is supposed to be the natural shape over here, the multiform existence, the multiplicity of living things. But, you know, we talked about the animal life as being kind of, like, self-conscious. This is, you know, I think you could make a case for either side. It doesn't really matter, uh, because what's really important here is what the artificer is doing. The artificer blends these shapes together and he says, and this ambiguous being, which is a riddle to it, to itself, the conscious wrestling with the non-conscious, the simple inner with the multiform outer, the darkness of thought mating with a clarity of utterance. Now there's a lot of stuff going on there, right? So let's look at each of these in turn. The ambiguous being right? Ambiguity um, in in Hegel's thing is going to be framed in terms of a a duality, right? The ambi in Greek means, you know, one of two. We we say something is ambiguous, it could have more than one meaning, right? But it really refers to a duo. And it's the same thing for the, you know, ambiguousness or ambiguity in German, zweifalt, right? It's twofold. And so, An ambiguity, a a, a duality going on there, which is a riddle, retzel, to itself, a thing to be figured out. The uh, conscious wrestling with the non-conscious. Interesting to talk about that, isn't it? Consciousness wrestling with what is lacking consciousness, but perhaps could have consciousness, right? Um, what else do we have here? The darkness of thought mating with the clarity of utterance. Now, isn't that an interesting way to talk about it? We usually think of thought as illuminating, right? The darkness of thought, the clarity of utterance. These are not even in the same register. One is visual, visual. 
And the other is, I suppose you could say clarity is visual if you're talking about a certain kind of like being able to see through things. But we usually, when we're talking about utterance, we're talking about meaning, right? So these are being united. And he tells us that these break into language. Language is being supplied now by bringing these both that lack language together. The language of a profound but scarcely intelligible wisdom. And actually the scarcely intelligible, it doesn't quite convey it. You know, the, the idea there is the wisdom is intelligible only with difficulty, right? Schwer uh, verständliches, understood with making an effort, with, with overcoming some, some difficulty, some heaviness, right? So this language is a really important step at this point. Now, the artwork, the fabrication thing, is going to be given a kind of agency, a kind of thought, a kind of consciousness, a kind of responsibility that hitherto it was lacking. In this work, there is an end of the instinctive effort which produced the work that, in contrast to self-consciousness, lacked consciousness. For in it, the activity of the artificer, which constitutes self-consciousness, comes face to face with an equally self-conscious, self-expressive inner being. In it, he has worked himself up to the point where his consciousness is divided against itself, where spirit meets spirit. In this unity of self-conscious spirit with itself, insofar as it is the shape and the object of its consciousness, its blendings with the unconscious shapes are purged of the immediate shapes of nature. These monsters in shape, word, and deed are dissolved into spiritual shape, into an outer that is retreated into itself and an inner that utters or expresses itself out of itself and in its own self into thought, which begets itself, which preserves its shape in harmony with itself and is a lucid, intelligible existence. Spirit is artist. With paragraph 698, we now reach a very important transition point. We are finishing up this small sub portion, uh, which has been called the artificer, right? And that in turn is part of the first subsection of the entire religion section, natural religion. We are getting to the end of what Hegel has identified as natural religion. And we see that there is now a movement past the, what, what we can call the limitations of natural religion. And from this point on, there's going to be a more intense focus on particular religions, which are taken as being, you know, of universal significance. So he tells us in this work, in the bringing to language work, there is an end of the instinctive effort which produced the work that in contrast to self-consciousness lacked consciousness. So we're no longer like a bunch of bees building their hive or people fabricating idols, which then don't speak to them and don't provide them with anything or, you know, more and more develop things, incorporating animal shapes, incorporating uh, plant, you know, ornamentation, crystalline structures. None of that stuff really gave us what we wanted. And, and what, part of what we want is for God or the gods to talk back to us, to engage with us. So he goes on and he says that in this, in the work, the activity of the artificer, which constitutes Ausmachen, right? Um, uh, Self-consciousness comes face to face with something that can respond to it, that can engage with it. He says an equally, an equally self-conscious, self-expressive inner being. That's worth dwelling on for a minute. So the, the work that has been created through the transformation of material along certain lines that are provided by the understanding or by observation of nature and the feeling that there's something, there's something sacred in this, 
Now we've created something that Hegel's saying is equally self-conscious. The God that I'm engaging with is just as self-conscious as I am. That means that that God is conscious of me as another self-consciousness in relation to it. And it's also not just self-conscious, self-expressive. It's able to communicate and, and to respond to me. So he goes on and he says, um, in this, we've worked ourselves up to the point where consciousness is divided against itself. And here he says, spirit meets spirit. So the artificer himself is spirit and the product, the equally self-conscious, self-expressive inner being, that too is spirit. Spirit is now able to meet itself. There's a greater feedback. There's a greater communication loop that's being generated here. And notice what's not happening, you know, master slave dialectic, all these, you know, unhappy consciousness, that's that sort of thing. That's not happening here. There's a kind of reconciliation taking place. So he says, this is a unity of self-conscious spirit with itself. And he says, insofar as it has the shape and the object of its consciousness, um, the shape of its consciousness, I, I guess you could say, is both the worker and also the worked upon thing that now has an agency of its own. The object of its self-consciousness. This is where it gets really interesting. We would say, well, the object is obviously the object that is produced as a work. But is it? Insofar as there's an equal self-consciousness and self-expressiveness on this side, the artificer, him or herself, can also be an object, right? Objectified, we say, is a bad thing, but being able to be seen as, as uh, another human being or as another sentient being, another rational being. That is what is being provided here by this, this process. So this is really an advance, isn't it? He goes on and he says it's being purged of, you know, these, these immediate shapes of nature, right? Uh, it's blendings with the unconscious shapes are purged of these immediate shapes of nature. And he talks about monsters. Monsters in shape, word, and deed are dissolved into spiritual shape, into an outer that is retreated into itself. The outer still is there, but now the outer is a vehicle in, into its own self, into thought, thought on the side of the God that begets itself, which preserves its shape and harmony with itself and is a lucid, intelligible existence, right? So this entire process, this entire uh, resolution or reconciliation now leads to the, the last sentence, spirit, this unity of self-conscious spirit with itself in the artificer, in the work uh, has, is now a work of art because spirit now is artist, kunstler. It's no longer a worker. It's no longer a fabricator. It's now an artist. And what does that mean? Well, we're going to get into this entire section, right, of religion in the form of art. But looking ahead, art for Hegel has a spiritual significance. That's part of what makes it art. It's not just putting nice colors on something or chipping away at stuff or making, you know, molding things that you can then say, oh, that's cool. That looks like a bird or anything like that. There's something more to it that makes it art. So, you know, we're moving away from, as he said, this instinctual activity and towards something that's more self-conscious and that expands the realm of self-consciousness into something that can ideally respond back to me. So we, we close this section now for once actually having a real advance and now ready to move into the religion uh, in terms of the work of art.